Working at Hooters isn't anyone's dream job. And that's true if you ask any Hooter girl. Knowing that you have to tolerate sketchy individuals throughout your shift doesn't make the task better. The slow and weary movement of time had me praying that no customer would enter for the last remaining five minutes before closing. I observed as Martha wiped the tables and our manager, Mr. Gunner, counted the cash sitting behind the counter. Lily, Martha, and I all leave the outlet together, and we three girls take that quite seriously. This fast food chain is a small one that has recently opened, so right now, we're the only employees working here along with our chef, Burton. Lily went to the washroom, and I was passing time reading the menu. The sound of approaching footsteps snapped me away from reading, only for my eyes to meet a disturbing-looking man. He smiled so big that I frowned, feeling uncomfortable. It took a while before I could utter a welcome and ask for his order. His ocean eyes scanned the top menu while biting his lower lip, and the sight alone made me consider hating the night shift. Welcome to Hooters. May I take your order? His attention returned to me, still sporting that smile, but what he said next made my stomach drop. I'd like the jumbo burger, please, but instead of the usual beef, I'd like your meat instead. What? He said those words in such a friendly manner, as if it was the most normal thing in the world, while I couldn't even breathe. I waited for a ha-ha, just kidding, but it never came. Hello? Are you listening? He asked as he waved a hand right in front of me, trying to snap me out of shock. As if his first comment wasn't terrifying enough, he went on, saying even more bizarre things. Ah, sorry. You close in five minutes, right? That's not enough time to cook your meat. I prefer areas down the waist. Meat is part for me. <laughs> he chuckled as he sent a wink my way. My tongue felt non-existent as fear took over my system. The ringing in my ears managed to muffle his voice and the horror that left his mouth. I started to sweat like a dog. Okay, you look scared. I guess I'll just have the large fries and large coke, please. Thank you so much. His last request was said with such a polite tone that I felt like my mind was ready to lose it. I watched as he took the table near the door right next to where Martha was cleaning. I felt cursed, like I was hexed to stand in that spot forever, with only the nightmare to keep me company. Martha noticed me standing there like a statue and called out my name. I came back to my senses, and with trembling feet walked back to the kitchen. Chef Burton was cleaning the kitchen. Seeing me walk in like a scaredy cat, he asked, Are you all right? You look horrified. That man! He said he wanted... Before I could finish, our manager, Mr. Gunner, screamed at me, saying, Stop the chit-chat and finish the last order. Burton, I'm leaving. Make sure you lock up after everyone. Chef Burton nodded his head and got back to his work with a reluctant face. I, on the other hand, couldn't tell anyone about the spine-chilling experience I had just had a few moments ago. Telling Burton to prepare that psycho's order, I headed straight to the bathroom looking for Lily. Coming out, I saw Martha standing there with a pale face. She grabbed my hand and said in a nervous voice, You won't believe what just happened. That man out there showed me a cut on top of his finger that had sliced through the skin, and before I could even offer a band-aid, he deliberately pulled that skin back with his teeth, pulled it off, and chewed it as he kept smiling at me. What the fuck is this shit? I felt every tension in Martha's body as she paced back and forth, trying not to heave. Martha turned ghostly white when I recounted what the man had said to me. We decided to call the cops. The signal was bad inside, so Martha walked out from the back door to call the cops, and I went to get Lily before she encountered this crazy man. I knocked on the washroom door and called out to her. Lily, come out! But no answer came. I twisted the doorknob and found it unlocked. Lily wasn't there inside the washroom. I quickly walked to the dining area. A cold rush went down my spine. Lily wasn't in the restaurant, and neither was that man. I don't know why, but an invisible alarm bell kept ringing in my ear. I rushed to the exit and looked outside. 
A small, rusty car was parked outside, and I saw Lily getting in it with that psycho. Lily, don't go with him! But before she could hear me, the man locked the car doors and hit hard on the paddle. The car took up sudden speed. I ran to stop the car and Lily noticed me. Her face changed as soon as she saw me. She yelled to the man. But you said they were waiting for me down the road! Oh my god! Shut up! The man punched her in the face right away, and Lily passed out on the passenger seat beside him. He drove away, abducting my friend while letting out a vicious smile of joy. Martha heard me scream, and I told her what had just happened. She immediately got into her car, and I hopped in. The cops won't be able to catch him if he escapes. We have to follow that freak. Yes, we have to save Lily. We started to drive like crazy. After five minutes of reckless driving, we finally saw that man's car driving away. Let's get this asshole, Martha said in a charged up voice, and the fear in me vanished too. She increased the car speed and we caught up to him. We started honking our horns like crazy and the man realized that we were following him. He increased speed too, but we were on fire. We drove and came parallel to his car. Our eyes met and I screamed. You won't get far, you jerk. The cops are on their way and we aren't going to leave you alone. Wherever you go, we're coming with you. Upon realizing that he wouldn't be able to dodge us, he did something dangerous. He suddenly unlocked the car door and pushed open the door on Lily's side. He then smiled even bigger and said in a psychotic voice, You're right. Here, take your friend. I'll eat something else tonight. <laughs> and pushed our unconscious friend out of the speeding car. Lily hit the hard road and started to roll in friction. Before we knew it, she came right in front of our car, and I screamed at the top of my lungs, Martha! Martha! Watch out! Martha hit the brakes, but as our car was at maximum speed, the tires creaked loudly and the crushing of bones echoed in the middle of nowhere. The car stopped after a few meters. Neither of us got out. It was as if we had forgotten how to move. We didn't even look at each other, just stared at the long highway ahead and kept breathing. Every breath was hinting toward the nightmare we were too afraid to encounter. But finally, we came out of our car and walked back with shivering footsteps. Lily was lying dead on the ground. Our speeding car ran her over. She was beyond recognition at that point. We waited there shattered, broken, and guilty for life. To save our friend, we had killed her. The police arrived after a short time, but upon inspection, the man was nowhere to be found. His car had no number plate. Statements were taken, and even the authorities couldn't hide the disgust that was etched in their faces as our story unfolded. Sleep never came to me that night, and neither to Martha. We are still a part of this ongoing investigation. I just hope the man gets arrested soon. That will be the only relief for us. Walking the streets had become something so difficult now, as I had developed a fear of strangers smiling. Whatever happened that night ruined me. To those working in outlets like Hooters, please always be careful. Deception is a mask that fits everyone. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the video. If so, please leave a like. And also, a small percentage of people that watch my videos are actually subscribed. If you want to support this channel and make this channel reach the 1 million mark, please consider subscribing. It's free and you can change your mind later. Enjoy. Sometimes I remember how a quiet, sunny Thursday turned into one of the worst days of my life. It may have happened many years ago, but every day, I relive that man's voice in my head, and I'm thankful to be alive. At the time, I worked at Hooters. It was my first job, and despite what everyone says about the place, I had a good time. When that strange man came in at the beginning of my shift, I knew something was wrong. He was harmless in appearance, 
quite short, and despite being no more than 50 years old, he was quite stooped over. The man was bald and had a blank stare, as if he had ended up in the restaurant by mistake. And given the profile of customers we had, that was a strong possibility. The man sat down at a table for two and raised his head as a sign that he expected to be served. I preferred not to wait on him, but I was the only girl available, and I saw out of the corner of my eye my manager, who was watching me. So I decided to approach the customer as soon as possible. Good morning, sir. Welcome to Hooters. My name is Rebecca, and I'll be serving you this afternoon. How can I help you? Rebecca, what a nice name. He said, whispering in a very slow and calculated voice. Thank you. That's very sweet, I said, trying to hide my discomfort. Have you thought about what you want to eat? Orange juice and french fries without salt. Bring me condiments and sit with me. I would like some company. He said with an authoritarian and macabre tone. Of course. Thank you very much. Those words still echo in my head. At that moment, I felt very uncomfortable and disgusted. We usually have customers who treat us badly or are simply very sexist. But there was something in that man's demanding and hateful voice that made me feel very bad. Anyway, I took his order and went to greet other customers. Hello, cutie. You come here often? Said a young man in a joking tone, causing his friends to laugh. For my salary, much more than I should. <laughs> I laughed falsely, but even still, the young men laughed with me. Well, you must be doing something right. You seem to have admirers looking at the other man's table. Turning around, I saw the man just looking at me. He didn't look angry, sad, or even jealous. He was just watching me. In response to this, I quickly went to get his fries and drink. I just wanted to finish with this customer and get him to leave as quickly as possible. As I sat down with him and set the food down, he almost snatched the orange juice out of my hands, drinking it all with hardly a breath or pause. I see you were thirsty, sir. Tell me a little bit about your life, Rebecca, he said, ignoring what I had just told him. Well, I don't have much to say. I've been working here for a few months now, and I'm having a great time. I'm here while I study to be a nurse. I plan to dedicate myself to that starting next year. At that moment, I didn't know what motivated me to tell him about my life. I guess I wanted him to empathize with me. What a beautiful career. You know... Sometimes I'm a nurse. What do you mean, sometimes? I like to be a nurse. But sometimes I have to be a police officer, a builder. But a lot of times I'm a mechanic. It depends on what my dolls need. Do you have dolls? Of course, dear. I have lots and lots of dolls in my house. When I find them, they always move a lot and are very noisy. But after a while, they just stop talking. I think I broke them. You mean... Plastic dolls, like toys, right? Maybe they don't have batteries. My voice showed fear, and I knew I shouldn't ask that question. But I was very nervous, and I just asked it. What happens is that sometimes I feel the need to be bad. If my mom saw me, she would be very angry. But sometimes I just want to be bad. He kept talking as if nothing was happening. But his gaze was lost. At that moment, I wondered if he was still talking to me. Sir, I don't understand what... Suddenly, he interrupted me, looking at me with his eyes wide open and a look that felt like it went through my whole body. Rebecca, would you be so kind as to bring me an orange juice and fries, please? Without speaking a word, I ran off to get his order, not realizing that he still hadn't touched the fries I had left for him earlier. Rebecca, is everything okay? I'm really not okay. That man scares the hell out of me. Did he say or do anything to you? No, but I know he will. You're old enough to know how things work here. We can't turn away clients just because we don't like them. I understand. My voice broke, and I almost started to cry. Stay calm. I'm going to be watching closely, and if that man makes the move, we'll throw him out. Without answering him, I just left with the fries and the drink. When I returned to my seat, the man didn't even look back, but reacted to my arrival by taking a deep breath. Here is your order. 
Sit down, my dear. I feel very lonely these days. My dolls don't talk to me anymore. He said it with such a sad tone that in any other context, I would have felt sorry for him. Of course, but only for a moment. I have to wait on other tables, I said with a strong and determined tone, while the man ignored the fries again and drank the juice as if he hadn't had anything to drink for days. Rebecca, I must tell you the truth. I hate orange juice. I'm sorry to hear that. You want me to get you something else? I said in a confused voice, looking for a chance to leave. But I have to drink it, you know. Otherwise, the itching comes back. It itches. It it itches so much. And I can't control it. His voice had changed. It sounded shaky and uncontrollable, as if he was about to have a breakdown. Do you want me to turn up the air, sir? I couldn't control myself. I was almost crying from fear. The man didn't even look at me, but it seemed like he could do something to me at any moment. I don't want to get itchy. It itches so much. When I get itchy, I feel the need to do something bad. I understand. Let me pick up your glasses of juice. I'll be right back, okay? At that moment, I just wanted to leave, but I was afraid he wouldn't let me. If I managed to leave, I knew I wouldn't go back to that table. In response to my question, the man looked at me for the first time in a while. His eyes were wide open, meeting mine in a way that was only possible in horror movies. In an evil, cold voice, almost whispering to me, he said a few last words. Rebecca, do you ever wonder what you look like on the inside? Terrified, I grabbed his glasses and left, crying. I couldn't even answer him. Reaching the bar, I heard many hurried footsteps behind me. As I turned around, I saw the man on the floor being restrained by two Hooters security men. As I got a better look at the situation, a chill ran through my entire body, and terrified, I dropped the glasses in shock. The man, who until a few seconds ago was talking to me, had a syringe in his hand. One of the security men noticed this and quickly pulled it out while the manager called the police. A few minutes later, the police had arrived and my manager was apologizing to me. It seems that the security men were on the lookout for this man, so they reacted in time and saved me. A few months later, I learned that this man had escaped from an insane asylum in a power outage a few months earlier. Within months, I left Hooters and my parents supported me until I started working as a nurse. I still go to therapy because of this, and since that day, I have never been able to go back into a Hooters. We only hire thin and pretty girls. That's what he said to me as I sat down in front of him to begin my interview. Luckily for you, you meet all those standards. So you start Monday. I had a smile on my face as he began to get out some documents for me to fill out. I knew I had the job in the bag before I walked in here, because I knew that applying to be a Hooters girl was one of the few jobs that only required my looks, and thanks to some great genes, I was a very pretty girl. The job was also a way for me to get some side cash as I got through college. On the day that I started, I was asked to report in with the manager and upon seeing the woman, I was shocked. The manager, who was called Mackenzie Jones, could only be described in two words, hideously horrifying, as her face was unhuman. Looking at her, I could tell she had done a lot of plastic surgery to boost her appearance, but it seemed like her efforts made everything worse, as her blotched skin looked like decaying plastic, and the increased size of her lips made her look animal-like. What are you called? She said to me, and I replied to her with, Hannah, ma'am. Hannah Garrett. As she spoke to me, I noticed that her slit eyes carried envy, and her voice was filled with hate. I didn't know why, as this was the first time that I had ever met her. But even in all this, I didn't say a word about it, as I was warned not to react to or make comments about the boss's appearance or character, as that would lead to an immediate firing. So I kept quiet and smiled on throughout the briefing. 
When it was done, I was given my uniform, and I went off to start my first day. After a few weeks of working at my Hooters joint, I realized a few things. For starters, everyone hated the manager, Miss McKenzie. She was a very odd and mean woman, as she constantly looked at all of us with hate. She would say things like, I'm not paying you useless bitches to sit there and look pretty. Now do something before I kick you out. At first, I thought it was just me, but I soon realized that she treated all of the waitresses like this. It was as if she hated our existence. To be honest, I didn't know why she was the manager, as I thought Hooters prided themselves on hiring beautiful women, but I guess that only applied to the waitresses, as it didn't matter what you look like if you worked behind the scenes. Apart from my mean boss, I loved working there, as I had found a sisterhood with the other waitresses. We loved and looked out for each other during work, and we talked and ate leftovers together when we were off duty. I remember telling them, if only we had a normal boss, everything would be perfect. I knew something was seriously wrong with Miss McKenzie, and unfortunately for me, I found out what in the following week. It was on a Friday, and I was working the evening shift. It had been a hectic week, as most of the girls had been falling sick, it was strange because it was just out of the blue, so the rest of us who were healthy had to increase our workload. Luckily for me, it was a bit late and work was slow, so I decided to go throw away the trash. As I walked back to the restaurant, I noticed that our manager, Miss McKenzie, had walked into the kitchen. I didn't want to run into her as I actively avoided her, so I decided to wait outside for her to leave. From where I was standing, I could clearly see into the kitchen from the window. So I became confused when Miss McKenzie began to do some very odd things. I watched her bring out a small grinder, a nail clipper, and some other little containers. I then watched as she carefully cut her nails. I was appalled as I wondered why she would do something so unhygienic in the kitchen, but I wasn't ready for what she did next. She gathered all her dirty cut nails and put them in the grinder. She ground them down till it became powder-like, and then I watched her sprinkle it onto the leftover food that was normally eaten or taken home by the waitresses. I had no words as my mind struggled to understand why she would do something so horrible. When she was done, I watched her take it up a notch as she cut pieces of her hair and she mixed it up with the food. I couldn't take it anymore, so I rushed to confront her. When I walked into the kitchen, I said the only word on my mind. Why? Without looking up from what she was doing, she replied with, Because you all deserve it. The feeling of disgust and anger welled up in me as I asked, Do you hate us that much? What did we ever do to you? That's when she screamed. You were born. You were chosen, and I wasn't. I, too, wanted to become a Hooters girl, but apparently I wasn't pretty enough. I wasn't thin enough. I wasn't good enough. They even told me that while I couldn't work as a waitress, I could work as a cleaner in the back. I went home asking myself why I wasn't chosen. I told myself that I was beautiful, too, but apparently I wasn't. I tried to change myself, but everything I did just made it worse. People made me feel like I was the embodiment of ugliness. I see how you all look at me. You try to hide it, but I see the disgust in your eyes. As she spoke, I saw tears fill up her eyes, and I almost felt sorry for her. But then she continued her long rant with, That day shattered me, but I wasn't going to give up. So I worked my way up, went to school, and after many years, I finally became the manager. I knew I could never reach the standard of beauty, so I decided to bring you guys down with me. Every day for the past six months, I've been cutting pieces of me into the leftover food that you girls eat. My fingers, toenails, pieces of my hair, even a bit of my feces. Rest assured, I made sure to add them in little untraceable quantities. So no matter how pretty you girls look on the outside, I comfort myself with the fact that pieces of me are inside all of you. And even if it's just a little, in a messed up way, 
You all have a piece of ugliness in you too. I felt bile instantly rise up in my throat as I began to throw up. My mind couldn't wrap around what I had just heard as I started to have a mini mental breakdown. I finally realized why most of us were getting sick and I wondered what kind of sick, deranged person would do that to people. I looked up to see Miss Mackenzie with a huge grin on her face as she said, It makes me happy to see you like this. I started to scream, I'll tell everyone, before she cut me off saying, You're fired and you can tell anyone you like, but it's your word against mine and I'm the fucking manager. <laughs> she laughed as she began to walk away, but I knew something like this would happen. So I said, I saw everything you did from outside and I knew you would deny it. So I took pictures just in case and to make sure no one could doubt me, I've also been recording this whole conversation. Enraged, I watched as she lunged at me trying to take my phone. I wasn't going to give in, so I fought back. The noise attracted the few customers and staff that we had, so we were separated in no time. I had some bruises, but I was happy, and I had a smile on my face, as I knew everything was over for the disgustingly vile woman called Mackenzie Jones. The case had caused a huge scandal around my town as the Hooters organization tried to calm the storm. They called each and every one of us and apologized while giving us fat checks and compensation as they hoped that we wouldn't sue. They also offered medical services to check and flush out any remaining residue in our system. As for Mackenzie, she was put in a mental health asylum as her lawyer pled insanity. With a check, I quit working there and I put myself through school and while it all ended in a happy way, I find myself thinking back to that day most of the time, as I came to realize that it was due to this misogynistic world that Mackenzie Jones had turned out this way. She was a woman whose worth was judged by her appearance, and she was told that she wasn't good enough. Hearing that broke her and turned her into a disturbing psychopath. I could never justify what she did, as she did it out of envy and spite. And while I blame myself for being one of the many people who judged her by her looks, I also blame the society that we live in, and I hope that maybe one day we will all be able to change.